welcome to the Art of Coaching Podcast, a show aimed at getting to the core of what it takes to change attitudes, behaviors, and outcomes in the weight room, boardroom, classroom, and everywhere in between. I'm your host, Brett Bartholomew. I'm a performance coach, keynote speaker, and the author of the book, Conscious Coaching. But most importantly, I'm a lifelong student interested in all aspects of human behavior and communication. I want to thank you for joining me. And now let's dive into today's episode. Behavior change is a core objective of any leader. And all of us, regardless of where we come from, our intelligence level, or our experiences, can be really stubborn at times and struggle to get out of our own way. Now, why hasn't this fact changed in the hundreds of thousands of years humans have been on this planet? Why, despite all of the books and the resources that are out there and the hard lessons learned, do we still struggle to do simple things like save for retirement, quit smoking, be more active, alter the way we communicate with others, or overcome basic daily obstacles that end up costing us time, money, and sometimes even relationships. I mean, literally, even when you try to mentor somebody, if you've been a mentor, you know that eventually you're going to see somebody not take your advice and learn those lessons the hard way, and it never matters how many have came before them. Now, usually this is because we fail to understand the realities of human nature. And thus, we end up creating strategies that are more hopeful than they are tactical. So to help us learn how we can better solve these problems, I sat down with world-renowned behavioral scientist, Katie Melkman. Now, Katie Melkman is an award-winning behavioral scientist and the James G. Dynan professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. She's worked with dozens of organizations to encourage positive change, including, get this, Walmart, Google, the U.S. Department of Defense, the American Red Cross, and many others. She co-founded and co-directs the Behavior Change for Good initiative at the University of Pennsylvania and hosts Choiceology, a popular Charles Schwab podcast about behavioral economics. Her research is regularly featured by major media outlets such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR. But here's one area I got the scoop. Until our episode, she had never talked about her athletic career. So we even get into all things coaching as well. And if you find this conversation to be up your alley, be sure to check out her latest book, How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. It's in hardcover and it's going to be available everywhere via Amazon on May 4th, 2021. All right, here we go with Dr. Katie Melkman. Hey, thanks so much for sitting down for another episode of the Art of Coaching Podcast. I am here with Dr. Katie Melkman. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure. I know with your book coming out, which we're definitely going to talk about and everything else, you are about to embark on a tremendous podcast tour. So for you to make some time is is not something I take for granted. Well, it's, it's an absolute honor. Well, listen, I want to uh, endear you to our audience right away because this is something that is not public knowledge. I mean, I, I, I dig and I try to find dirty little secrets on all of our guests, you know, as a, as a nice surprise, but this is one you were gracious enough to give me. You do so much phenomenal work in the behavior change space and you have an amazing career in academia that is by and large, like just getting started. I've read a lot of your articles. I'm a deep appreciator of your work. But one thing that you don't tell everybody is you have a background in sports and that you enjoy sports and you're a nerd about sports performance in many respects as well. Talk to me a little bit about your background as an athlete before we get into Dr. Milkman, the researcher. Yeah, well, and it's funny because we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about the many identities we, we walk around with and how they change throughout life. But my identity before I was a researcher was as an athlete. So I played Division I tennis um, and, you know, my my childhood years, I spent a huge number of them training and thinking about how I could get better, how I could outsmart my opponents, how I could improve my performance and endurance. And so it's really fun to to have the opportunity to think about um, change with the uh, with the behavioral science lens, but talking about it with someone who, who focuses on sports. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like, so I'm glad you brought it up because my life and so much of the life of our listeners is predicated on behavior change with athletes. You know, some of the best in the world, if not at the absolute zenith. Now, on the other hand, we also have people that work with youth athletes and they're still learning. But either way, whether it's youth or Olympians, 
getting them to change is hard. You know, before we dive into the meat of everything here, just exploring your background as an athlete some more, how did you take to coaching? How did you take to criticism? Where were areas that you felt like, no chance, I'm pretty good in this space? And where did, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I had coaches who I really clicked with, like one coach specifically, his name is Bob Pass. He was, um, st- I started working with him when I was 10 and I worked with him until I was 18 and went off to college. And I think, uh, the, the thing that made that coaching relationship work so well was that I just, I felt like he was sort of a, a parent figure. I completely trusted that he had my best interest at heart. I felt close to him. I felt, um, heard and like he really valued me as a person and wanted to see the best things happen to me and so that that was really important and I you know I tried other coaches and had other people I worked with and finding someone who really felt like a mentor and a guide and who I could admire in all walks of life and and trust has always been important it's funny because when I came to academia I've had some amazing mentors too it's actually a very similar world where you need to have that close relationship with basically a sponsor who helps make your advancement possible in the academy. You you have a dissertation advisor who's all important, just like my coach was so critical in my childhood. And I found those same characteristics, someone who just 100% believes in you and who you respect and admire immensely has been critically important. I actually write about both of my key coaches in the book. Um, Bob gets a little uh, time in the book and um, Max Bazerman, who is my dissertation advisor, and and they had a lot of similar characteristics. So I, I feel lucky that I found coaches who um, who were almost like parents in that sense. Yeah, and your book even starts off, I now understand the tennis reference in a completely different light. I love the story you talk about uh, starting off with Andre Agassi, right? And, and uh, before I get into that, I do have to say a, a deep appreciation for the fact that when you talked about your coach, so many of our listeners, you know, they feel like they have to have all these credentials and work with world champions and what have you and have the perfect job to get buy-in. And you mentioned the term, you know, being bought in several times in your book. And really, it sounds like to me that your coach, what, what really improved that buy-in with you was the quote unquote soft stuff, right? Like they listened to you. They made you feel heard. They met you where you were at. It wasn't, they tried to steer you, to, uh, steer you towards their agenda. It was this partnership of give and take. Am I hearing you correctly when you say that? You're absolutely hearing me correctly. And like the, you know, both of my, the coaches who I mentioned, they had good credentials, but really that wasn't what made them so extraordinary. It was, um, that they, you know, one of the, one of the things I write about in my book is that I think my mentor in graduate school, one of the reasons he's one of the most successful mentors in our whole field is that he had this appreciation that if he believed in us and showed us how much he believed in us, he could boost our confidence. And, uh, and he could make it possible for us to get further. And, and he did really smart things like having us coach other more junior students so that not only were we hearing advice, but we were giving advice. And we ended up learning a lot through those experiences and, and feeling that um, he believed we had what it took not only to achieve our goals, but to help other people he believed in achieve theirs. So that was a really important part of his philosophy. Yeah. And, and, and within that, and I appreciate you going deeper in, in that space, because when we think about what helps people overcome some of these barriers to change and your book, you go into such a great framework and and you admit there are so many and they're so complex, but one thing that, that we know that kind of tugs in an interesting space, especially with you being in academia and our listeners world of having to be so data driven as well with the human body and performance is despite the information we may give others or even their intellectual capacity, that information isn't enough to always change that behavior, is it? No, absolutely not. And I think, you know, that was one of the most important things I discovered in my career is that, um, you know, early on when I was talking to to folks, I was start, just starting out trying to figure out how do we, how do we make change happen? What can I do? And from my um, background as a scientist to help, I was talking to leaders and public health organizations and HR departments and consistently hearing the same thing. You know, we've given people all the information. They still don't sign up for the 401k that would set them on the path to success, even though they say they want to have a secure retirement. They still don't quit smoking, even though they completely get that it's terrible for them. They still don't go to the gym. So the information is so frequently not the gap when we want to make an important change um, that I, I basically realized, like, I need to pivot away from that and find uh, the levers that, that will really work, um, when information isn't enough, which is so often the case. 
And it, it takes a while with that for people to be receptive to that. So getting into the intro of your book and you started with Andre Agassi, which by the way, I didn't know you taught me something immediately that I didn't know his father was a boxer and I used to compete in golden gloves. And I can't believe you didn't know that. I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know that. And I didn't know that. And I was a strength coach for men's and women's tennis in, in a division one collegiate space. But what was fascinating, and I want to paint this picture for the viewers, and then I want you to, obviously it's your book, but there was this part where, you know, when, when I fought Katie, one of my biggest weaknesses was similar to Agassi's, you know, weakness in tennis. I didn't know at first that every punch wasn't supposed to be a knockout. I didn't know the purpose of the jab was to set up the cross and this and that. And here you illustrated such a wonderful story of you have this guy who is tremendously skilled, right? Tremendously skilled, has this image and this style. He's the it person in the sports world at the time, yet he's not meeting expectations. He's crumbling under that. Yet he had the humility to go and ask a competitor for advice. Can you elaborate on that a little bit so our, our listeners have an intro into that wonderful story? Yeah, well, actually, this is speaking of, um, you know, trust and mentors, it was really, he had a manager who was an, a long time friend who pushed him to, uh, to talk to Brad Gilbert when he was without a coach, his ranking was plummeting, and Agassi knew he needed some sort of change if he was going to live up to his potential. It wasn't happening. Like his, you know, his competitors from juniors were soaring past him in the rankings, Courier, Sampras, Chang, people who everyone said um, was better. And so if those names aren't familiar, because you're not a tennis nerd, those are other famous <laughs> tennis players from the 90s. Um, and his manager talked him into sitting down with Brad Gilbert, who was an inelegant player, a scrappy player, a player who had just written a best-selling book called Winning Ugly, and literally was able to maintain rankings that were out of line with what anyone had ever expected of him because he was such a brilliant strategist. And the pitch was, could Agassi convince Gilbert, and actually could Gilbert also convince Agassi, <laughs> um, could they convince each other to work together and, and what could Gilbert teach Agassi? So they had this dinner that I write about that was, I think, really momentous where Gilbert explains to Agassi his insight about what Agassi is doing wrong. And the insight is pretty simple. He basically says, look, you're going out there and you're focused on yourself and you're trying to hit winners on every shot and you are giving up a huge advantage you could gain if you just thought about your opponent and strategically try to take advantage of their weaknesses. So don't just play your game, play against your opponent, figure out how you can win by letting them lose. And this was, I think, a really important change and, and key moment in Agassi's career. He ended up hiring Gilbert, went on to um, win the U.S. Open later that year, even though he was unseated, and to have a career that, you know, is now legendary, where he was ranked number one in the world for over 100 weeks. That was, you know, there were still some ups and downs, but that was a major turning point when he realized the key to success in his sport was not to just go out and play blindly the best tennis he could, but to be really thoughtful and careful about figuring out what was going on with his opponent. How could he change his game strategically? It turns out that change generally, the science of change is actually very similar, even though we don't appreciate it. Often we try to use these sort of one size fits all universal sounds good strategies, like, you know, set audacious goals and visualize success. And those things sound Drives great, <laughs> but it really, it depends on what the obstacle is just just as you need to know who your opponent is across the tennis court, if they have a strong forehand, a backhand, if they're weak when they bend or run for the ball, whatever it is that you need to pound and take advantage of in order to defeat them with the highest probability, you need to figure out what is your opponent in the battle to change? Uh, what is holding you back? Is it forgetting? Is it bad habits? Is it confidence? Is it that you too easily give into the temptation to do something that isn't in your long-term best interest? And whatever that thing is, that is what you need to work to change. And that's sort of, that's really what my book is about. But um, the insight comes through, hopefully, uh, in a fun way with the story of Agassi that, you know, tennis informed a lot of of my insights about behavior change. Without a doubt. And, and, and thank you for elaborating on that because our audience will relate to several pieces. Before I get into that, I do have to say, I love the part where they talk about how he went and they didn't have the beer that he wanted. So he, he went across the street and it was like, by the way, can you put this in, in your fridge? And meanwhile, they're just sitting here like, sure, man, I'll put, I'll put your <laughs> beer in our fridge. Um, 
Brad Gilbert is a character. And by the way, I should make a plug also for Agassiz's amazing um, autobiography, Open, which, uh, you know, tells this rich story with, you know, a different purpose and to a different point. But that's where I learned about this. And I saw in it immediately uh, the insight that's sort of at the heart of my book, even though he, he was mostly telling his life story and trying to explain how, you know, how he progressed. Um, but to me, it was like, wow, that is such a beautiful distillation of what holds us back in all kinds of change. Well, and why I'm glad you put it into your book and, and what I think our reader, our listeners will relate to most is you did a great job of using local and global examples. A lot of books on behavior change or a lot of research on behavior change, it's very easy. And by the way, we should focus on these things. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but it's always easy to look at the big things like obesity and smoking and, and 401k and what have you, we have to. But a lot of times issues with change happen internally. Like we see this in coaching Coaches are very good at telling other people to change, but you know, one stat that I talk about frequently is out of 256 coach development workshops, only 6% focus on interpersonal skills. And so as part of my doctoral research, we try to focus on why are coaches not going and learning how to be more skillful at interacting? And it might humor you to know that many of them say, well, I coach for a living, I'm communicating all the time. And I always say, well, I'm married, that doesn't make me a better spouse. Um, but we find this, this, that they don't want to change and the literature suggests, well, you know, a lot of times their jobs are on the line. I, you know, I think I have this statistic. Um, if you look at in 2012, there's research showing that teams in the NFL, MLB, NHL, and NBA, the average tenures, 2.9 years, 2.0 years, uh, two years, 1.4 years and 1.3. So a lot of coaches just feel like, well, I've got to invest in technical stuff and tactical stuff. Cause I can show this. Then if we win, I can point and say, no, this was the tool. But all this to say, you did a wonderful job of talking about sometimes our issue with change is ourself. It's that blind spot that Agassi had, but he was able to go and say, I'm going to drop my pride. I'm going to talk to a would-be competitor, and, and he was a competitor, and they're going to help me grow. What, why do you think it is that sometimes we, and maybe even you, you feel free to use an example of your life where you knew like, yeah, I got a blind spot, but I don't know if I really want to dive into that right now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So often. And I, I mean, one thing that's hard about human nature is that we have fragile egos. And so um, recognizing our, our limits and acknowledging them is threatening, right? It, it feels bad. <laughs> so, 100%. so it's a hard thing to do. But when we do, it's so powerful because, you know, um, you know, patching those weaknesses, it, it's really, you know, it's what separates the good from the great. Yep. Yeah. No. And that's why winning ugly is such a great, you have to improvise and then you get addicted to the messiness. So, you know, you, you given this, and this is me giving you a hard time a little bit to bring some levity. You've been able to collaborate with some of the world's best economists, psychologists, computer scientists, and doctors with respect to behavior change. I want to know why not coaches, um, you know, and then you've also had not only you're widely published, but I remember the first time I heard you was on Freakonomics. And this was several years ago. I was on an international flight and you had a, a, a huge project going on there. I think I believe it's still ongoing. The one with uh, Angela Duckworth, correct? It's still ongoing. Yeah, we've it's growing and growing. <laughs> and so how do you battle from somebody that's put so much value out in the world and you've had great platforms recognize your value and help you to promulgate that? How do you deal with the internal stress of saying, man, we still deal with some of these, like the information's out there, the stuff's out there. Um, I, maybe the needles move to a point where you'd like to see it. I'm sure you'd like it to be much more. How do you handle that level of, uh, I don't want to say disappointment because that's not the right term, but that level of, of desire to see it grow and just the slow, painful nature of people being like, no, it's not easy enough yet. Do, do you struggle with that at all? Or do you just keep your head down and keep plugging away? You know, it's funny, you know, we started by talking about my background in sports. I will just say, I think that the thing that has best prepared me for this work in so many ways is having played so many tough matches and lost so frequently that I, I know failure is just a part of any adventure. And, and I know how to deal with it from having faced it so many times, starting at such a young age. And, you know, it feels so crushing to lose a match to your rival when you're 11 years old and you feel like your life is on the line. Now that I'm a 39 year old professor and I write a paper and science rejects it, or, you know, I run an experiment and the hypothesis doesn't hold up. It isn't something I have that much trouble dealing with. It's just, you know, take it in stride. You recognize you win some, you lose some, and you get right back up and keep plugging forward. And hopefully it's, you know, two steps forward for every one step back. So 
I think that thick skin from sports has been really valuable as an academic, um, trying to solve tough problems where, frankly, we you know, there is no magic single solution. We're making small steps forward. It's been exciting, all the things that we have discovered in the last 20 years since I started working in this field. But, uh, you know, honestly, it would also be a little bit boring if we had solved it. Like, what would I do with the rest of my life? Yeah. So the challenge continues, just like in sports, right? You get there's another there's another um, game to play the next day and, and there's more progress to make. Yeah, I think that's very well stated. Whenever somebody comes to me and they say, hey, I'm having trouble getting an athlete or an individual or a GM to buy in, you know, what's going on? This is causing me a lot of problems. I'm like, listen, like, that's a great problem to solve. You know, these are these are things that you need to be prepared for. But there's this there's this deep lie that a lot of coaches are told and just professionals in general, right? Like, just learn the trade craft and, you know, then get a job and you're going to be good. And they're not they're not astute or, you know, they're it's this politic micro political stuff that they're not learning. And that's, what's got to make this stuff. You know, if you want to go at the highest level, you're going to get a, you're going to have to get your hands dirty. You know, when you talk about this and now getting into the core really of, of your book, one thing I was surprised to learn is with so much of our life being around us having to make sense of moments, right? Whether it's a notable failure stuff that you experienced in your athletic career, or you're a mother, if I'm correct. Right. Yes, I am. Yeah, you're a mother. So like we have these moments that we have to make sense of. It was surprising to me to figure out that your fresh start concept, as you've labeled it, hadn't really received much attention in the literature. Did that surprise you at all? This idea of, you know, this fresh start, New Year's resolutions, Easter, all these things that pick your religion, as you said before, and 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 there's something that that indicates a fresh start or New Year, uh, like if we take a new job, anything like that. Why do you think this stuff had been neglected in the literature for so long? It's a, it's such a good question. I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about science is um, that, you know, there's some vision of it as like linearly progressing, but in reality, it's just like a bunch of brains and uh, coincidences that spark an idea and then, and you end up with blind spots because there isn't a more systematic approach to filling in the gaps. And I think I was lucky to be at this event um, about a decade ago at Google where I got asked a question that made me realize there was this giant gap. Uh, an HR leader at Google said, okay, like I'm totally sold that we should be doing more to nudge people to make change in their lives. Uh, and I'm just wondering, like, is there a good time, Katie, when we should be doing that? Like, is there some optimal time to encourage change? And like a light bulb went off, like, whoa, what a great question. Yep. This hasn't been studied before. And it led my team down this incredibly fruitful path of studying these moments, these fresh starts that give us a sense that we're beginning a new chapter in our lives and turn out to really motivate change because we feel like, you know, an identity has been shed, like the old me is sort of behind me and whatever they goofed on, whatever mistakes they made, that's the old me and the new me is going to be able to nail this. And so um, there's that opportunity, that optimism that we can build on. And also the sense that when we start something new, when we face a new beginning, as small as the beginning of a week, as big as, you know, being traded to a new baseball team, which is, by the way, one of the topics my former student, Heng Chen Dai, has studied and how that can serve as a fresh start. Um, Whatever it is that shakes things up, and gives us that new start. It also leads us to step back, think big picture about our goals, and um, and we're able to do more when we have that sort of clean slate feeling. Hey, it's Brett here. I hope you're enjoying the episode. Listen, if you found a number of these conversations on the podcast to be especially interesting to you or somebody you know, be sure to go to artofcoaching.com forward slash channels. Again, that's artofcoaching.com forward slash channels to check out our all access group. It's brand new and it's a place where myself and professionals from all over the world have collaborative discussions on how to solve many everyday problems we face in life, our work, and our own professional development. It does not matter where in the world you are. And this is a very easy way to engage in discussion with me directly, my team, and other professionals every single week. Again, that's artofcoaching.com forward slash channels artofcoaching.com forward slash channels. I can't wait to be able to speak with you. Also, this episode is brought to you by Saga Fitness, developers of the world's first sweat resistant Bluetooth enabled BFR cuffs. Now, if you're thinking, what are BFR cuffs? BFR cuffs are a training tool that really help complement your regular training methods, but help you achieve your fitness goals much more efficiently. 
Whether it's general improved fitness, when combined with aerobic or high intensity interval training, BFR can actually improve VO2 max in your aerobic capacity. If you want to build muscle, adding BFR to your strength program can enhance the training stimulus, resulting in greater muscle protein synthesis and growth even when you're using lighter weights. It helps you train at 100% intensity, whether it's with weights or your body weight, which make your muscles work harder and get stronger. Guys, this is research back. This isn't a fad. This isn't something that you're going to love for a little bit and then throw under your bed or lose in a suitcase. Make sure to check them out by going to Saga, that's S-A-G-A dot fitness. Again, just Saga, S-A-G-A dot fitness, and you can save 20% by using code BRETT20. That's saga.fitness. Use code BRETT20. All right, back to Dr. Melkman. Whatever it is that shakes things up and gives us that new start, it also leads us to step back, think big picture about our goals, and, um, and we're able to do more when we have that sort of clean slate feeling. You're our ideal guest on this podcast because of something you just did. You have so many anchor points that I want to dive into that it then becomes a challenge for me as the host to say, okay, I want to, I want to make sure she feel heard. She feels heard there. And we dive into that, but also this, so I'm going to work with me as I try to structure this next question in conjunction with what you mentioned. You, You talked about Google. Now, everybody tends to think about their issues as, oh, surely nobody deals with this, or I'm not at a high enough level, or if I just made it to this company or this organization, right? right We all have this imposter phenomenon and also this kind of bias that the, these problems are very uniquely our own. And then you have Google, which you, you, know, you speak about in your book. Listen, you have access to world-class restaurants. You have all these amenities. You have a wonderful match program. You have so much autonomy within what you do. And still, at the very base level, they struggled to get people to use half the damn things. You know, it's like people wouldn't be, they won't even do the 401k. And that's something as old as time. It's like, Hey, we, we've got to do it. It's a match. It's just, and, and then I, I think within that, what I'm asking is one, you know, what do people need to understand about the fact that this occurs everywhere? It's not just you. And that two and you mentioned this in your book as well, it's not as easy as gamifying or making it a default. There is a timing issue, which is not something we're always told. Feel free to take that where you will, and then I'll build off of that with the next question. Well, I don't know about for you, Brett, but for me, I actually found it really to be a relief. Yeah. I just discovered that, like, it's not me, it's everyone that has problems. 100%. Um, Right? Like, and I think if, if you... Um, especially when you're young, you look around, right? Like the classic kid looking up and thinking their parents have it all figured out. And then you get older and you're like, oh, wait, they didn't. I actually think it's a relief to discover that everyone else is struggling and confused too. And these are universal things. And the nice thing about that mean is that it means if they're kind of universal, then we can study them and science can make progress on figuring out, okay, um, if most, you know, if lots of people struggle, just like I do to work up, you know, the energy and motivation to go to the gym at the end of a long day or to set aside the time to organize their finances or, you know, whatever goal it is or to, to learn the foreign language and actually get on Duolingo every night, whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. Um, if it's common, it's it's a little easier to feel like maybe I can find solutions by talking to people I know who've been through this too. And and then science can offer more because because we can look and explore like what universally can be helpful with each of these different barriers. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. One area that I'm almost embarrassed to admit on air is when I had I self-published my first book and that was a messy process. And I remember talking to the first literary agent and I, I mentioned this before on the podcast, but he said, well, who are you and what field are you in? And I said, well, I'm in sports performance. You know, technically my title is a strength and conditioning coach. And he goes, yeah, sorry, uh, somebody in the gym isn't as marketable as, and, and he literally mentioned like, you know, an academic or a military leader and what have you. And so I remember like, I got off the phone in like 30, I got on the phone filled with hope, fresh start. We're gonna talk to a literary agent. I got destroyed. The guy didn't even give me a moment to like, you know, talk about anything. And then I remember, you know, we self-published our own book by the grace of God became a bestseller. And then, you know, somebody was like, well, you should do this on Audible. Well, I had to do all that myself. I had another friend that wrote a New York Times bestseller, large publisher, had a lot of help, you know? And I said, man, you've got it, you, you've got it good, dude. Like I had to hire this, I had to contract this, I had to do this. And he goes, bro, the book that you can buy right now is not the book I wrote. He goes, that publisher changed it, it did this. And he's like, yes, there are some great things about it, 
but understand. And, and that was total naivete on my end. I'm thinking, woe is me. This situation was hard. You know, I'm just perceived as this kind of thing. And, uh, and ironically, then my book sold more than his. And I was like, I just felt like a jerk. I felt like a jerk about complaining about something. Everybody's got these issues at the highest level. Everybody. Um, another thing I, I appreciate about everything you talk about is the importance of timing. Going back to athletes for a moment, we have to cue athletes at critical periods. Just like, you know, the, when you give advice to folks, that, that matters. Like, you know, if we try to pair up some kind of goal or an aspirational behavior and it's, it's mismatched with, as you talk about in your literature, a temporal landmark, there's going to be incongruency. And then you evaluate it and you're like, well, was it the proposed change? Uh, was it the audience? Was it, was it the timing? What did you find as you started to dive into the research on the timing aspect and these temporal landmarks a little bit more that maybe surprised you? Yeah, well, one of the things that was really interesting, and this is research um, in my my former PhD student, Heng Chen Dai, who's now a professor at UCLA, it was in her dissertation work. Um, she discovered that while these fresh start moments are, as, as I've already described, great opportunities for us to pursue positive change, they can also have an ugly underbelly. And actually, specifically, I, I mentioned briefly, she did a study of baseball players, and that's where she was able to look at this. So she looked at baseball players who were traded to a new team, which is a major fresh start. Yep. Uh, and she looked at actually two types of trades, um, cross league trades, where all of your season to date statistics are reset. So you literally have a clean slate when it comes to performance um, tracking and those who were traded within league. So, you know, they're also moving to a new city, moving to a new team, new teammates, new coach, but they get to hold on to their track record. It just keeps on yep. ticking. And what she found both groups, um, she sees sort of the fresh start, effect, the classic fresh start effect, um, meaning the disruption changes, what's going on. I'll say more about how in a moment. Um, it's bigger for the folks who experience the bigger reset. So they're traded across leagues and they have more change going on. But here's what's really interesting. So for the players who were performing um, really well, they were having extraordinarily good seasons. The, the trade across leagues is harmful and it's particularly harmful for the ones who have the reset. So. Uh, it seems like not only can we see fresh starts help when the players who aren't performing very well, the reset's great. They start, you know, kicking it up and, and they've got the, the clean slate, fresh start, new routines. I'm going to do better. But the ones who've been on a roll, that disruption is harmful. And so I think that's actually a really important part of fresh starts. And, and we're talking right now at the end of a period that's been very unusual for many people, right? This COVID era um, where a lot of us are about to, you know, a lot of athletes are still getting, thankfully, right now to practice in person. But a lot of people are about to return to offices and schools that have been long shuttered. And we're going to experience this sort of a reset and, and fresh start. And it could be great for the um, habits that we're not pleased with that we want to put in, in, a, in a better mode. But anything that's going well is going to be disrupted. So if you've got like a great workout routine going or a work from home thing that's really you've got, got a pattern, you're going to lose that. And you're going to have to be actually really deliberate in order to build positive new behaviors and positive change. So I do think it's an important thing to keep in mind about temporal landmarks and, and fresh starts of all kinds that while they give us an opportunity because we have this clean slate, we have a disruption to whatever we've been going about doing either purely psychologically, like if it's a Monday or um, absolute in an absolute sense, if you're like moving to a new place or going into an, an office you haven't seen in a year, uh, that disruption isn't always good if you're doing well. Yeah, very, very happy you brought that up, this stress of fresh starts. And the, the jerseys behind me, there's one athlete that just after 11 years in the NFL, he's having his own fresh start. Now he retired. There's another one that just signed a two-year deal with a new team. Now you would think he'd be happy. Uh, he's in the NFL. He's far surpassed the, the league minimum or the league average rather of how long somebody stays in the league. And I asked him about that. I said, are you excited? Because he's going to a team that has a tremendous history of winning. The winningest, if not one of the most winningest organizations in, in all of sport. And he said, well, here's a tricky thing. He goes, yes, I'm excited, but there's so much ambiguity about when we're starting up mini camp. He goes, I don't know the system I'm going into. You know, he had been traded to a good team before. And then the position coach that he had, even though the team was solid, the position coach was not, you know, and he's like, I can't relate to him. He doesn't give me much coaching. And so there's so many meta categories and subcategories of these fresh starts. It's not always apples to oranges. That That's fruit. That can be compared. Sometimes it's apples to anchovies, you know, and I even think about this myself of 
you know, there's certain times of the year where I no longer train athletes as part of my work evolving and doing what I'm doing. My doctorate and a new book is taking a tremendous amount of time, right? And, uh, you know, usually when I have that fresh start and guys are coming back to prepare for the off season, I feel renewed, right? To your point and much of your literature and, and your wonderful book. But this year I kind of felt stressed. And I remember my wife said, what's wrong? And I go, well, I know that I love coaching these guys. That's not the problem. The problem is the impending uh, anxiety I have that it's still time for my day that's taking apart from this work. And I don't have those research. I don't have a lot of research assistance to really help. It's, it's all on me. Um, and then when I'm done with them, I've kind of scratched that coaching itch. Great. It's brought renewed perspective to my work. My writing and other stuff tends to be better. But it is this mix of emotions. It's not always, hey, fresh start. Things are great. Anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think um, it's really interesting to hear you talk about the, the player who's experiencing some anxiety about going to this fabulous new team. I would say, I think, um, you know, and I, I do not have data to back this up. I would like to have data to back it up. I, it's, so I'm going to throw out a hypothesis sure. that I would love to test. But I do think that um, some awareness of the disruption that's coming and um, deliberate planning related to, okay, what were the things that were working well in the last organization you were with in the last team? We know that these disruptions for baseball players were leading to worse performance for the ones who were on a roll. I, I wonder if I could have whispered in their ear and said, like, this is coming. Here's the risk that you face and, and gotten them to, to be really deliberate, write down what is working so well right now. What are the routines you don't want to allow to go off track and then make a plan for how you'll maintain them if that might actually be effective most people you know go into these fresh starts and these disruptions kind of blind and just like roll with the punches but i do you know there's a lot of research on how powerful it can be to make really concrete plans about how you are going to achieve whatever it is you set out to achieve so i, I wonder if we could plan for that disruption recognize what is about to be thrown off and tr and try to prevent it from happening if if there might be better outcomes. Yeah, I think you can. And this is where our worlds collide a little bit because one, on, on a very small level, and then I'll go larger with it, we find that when it comes to ratings of perceived exertion, when we put an athlete through a certain protocol, right? And this could be um, uh, can, what we call energy system development, or let's, let's think of layman term cardio, right? If they have a certain conditioning protocol they've got to do, or even a, a heavy or strenuous weight training session. If we let them know, hey, you know, this is a session that's going to be pretty brutal today, or this is going to be very challenging. We actually see their subsequent ratings of that, uh, the difficulty of the session was lower. They're like, well, no, I didn't think it was as hard as you said. And we, we know this a little bit intuitively because if somebody says, Katie, I just saw the funniest movie. You've got to see this. Well, now in general, you're kind of poisoning the well, you know, because they're like- Totally. The power of our expectations is so great. And I love that you're going there because that's another thing I- I wrote a bit about and sort of like very closely related to the placebo effect, yep. which everybody's familiar with in medicine, where you expect a sugar pill to produce some benefit for you medically and magically like it, it actually does for 60 to 90 percent of medical conditions. If you give someone a sugar pill, they think it was prescribed by a doctor to help them. It does um, like, you know, just amazing stuff. So what we believe has these huge implications for what we experience, how we behave, how we perform. Uh, and so I really love the the connection there to what you're saying about, you know, I, I prepare you for a strenuous workout, you're mentally expecting it, and then you can, you know, you can really take it on. Whereas if I prepare you and, I, and you're, you believe it's going to be easy and then I overwhelm you, it can be, it can be a bad. A hundred percent. And I think even more fat, we've got to talk offline about this stuff. We were just going through some research because uh, so much of what we do is on communication. So you mentioned the placebo effect. There's great community. There's great research in the medical world talking about when oncologists present information to their patients, right? And they're evaluated on a combination of warmth plus competence, right? And just having an interaction that is uh, considered more warm in the empirical definition is relative to that study, right? Uh, they find that that acted almost like a placebo effect. Patients then rated their treatment in the preceding in, in the subsequent weeks as saying, "Hey, this was more effective." You know, and they compared that with doctors that came and gave them a lot of jargon and, you know, in intensive nomenclature that, you know, or even just didn't remember their name, maybe didn't use their name, Katie, right? Like didn't say these things. And so we're even finding the warmth of our interactions, you know, which we know inherently from marketing literature and, and imagery and what have you. But it is fascinating that it can still have that physiological effect of it showed that it enhanced uh, recovery from intensive cancer treatment. So, you know, all these things and, and within that, um, you talking about the adjacent possible saying, Hey, you're going to get traded. And inherently these are some things that are going to happen. And, and you hear it every day. Come hang out with us anytime. Yesterday, the conversation was, I don't know where to live yet. 
the NFLPA hasn't even uh, figured out what they're doing negotiations wise. They're, they're telling us to boycott and it's one week out. He goes, I just got traded. If I boycott, then I go into this team with, you know, a situation that's not, not ideal. That's not how you want to be thought of when somebody's just paid you millions of dollars. He goes, I want to be a part of the team, but we also need to do what's ethical and responsible given the nature of the restrictions. And so not one bit of our conversation that day was about sports performance. It was about the external stressors he felt related to this, even when these teams have people that help them manage that. Yeah, no, I mean, just going back to how important these internal barriers are. And when we recognize what we're up against, we can do so much more to make progress. So talk to me about this. And in, in your book, you also mentioned in shifting gears a little bit outside of sports performance, uh, I believe it was 2002. And I apologize if I don't pronounce the name correctly, Omar Andaya, uh, the president of Green Bank in the Philippines. Did I pronounce his name correctly? You did. Yeah, you nailed it. Okay, cool. Um, struggled to get people to surprise, save more money right? And you had a wonderful statistic in there. And you said like, listen, getting people to do this is hard. Even in the U S only one in three families. And this is in 2015 had any money saved whatsoever. Can you elaborate on some of the problems they were having and, and how you helped them approach this kind of issue? Yeah. Well, at first I should say, um, you know, this is, I think this is a really fascinating case study. I actually wasn't involved in the original research. I'm just a huge admirer of it. So, sure. um, Dean Carlin, Nava Ashraf and Wesley Yin are three brilliant economists who got involved with when the, they saw this challenge, they were really interested in how to help encourage people to save more. They recognized one of the big challenges with saving is that people, you know, they mean to set something aside. They even put it in the bank, but then something comes up you know, a birthday, a holiday, um, you know, some, some exciting opportunity and, and they dip into that savings and, and sure enough, you know, and then it, it's gone. There's just a lot of leakage and people recognize that as a problem, but they are too tempted to dip in when these opportunities arise and they can't maintain balances that accumulate. So what they came up with and worked with, um, with Green Bank to test was a different kind of account. And the account was just like a standard savings account where you put your money in and it earns the same interest rate as everything else, but you're not allowed to take your money out of it once you've put it in until you've reached a predetermined savings goal or a predetermined date. Mm. So it's like a financial chastity belt, right? Yep. Like it, it just, you can't take it out. Um, and it turns out, you know, not everyone wanted this, <laughs> but they offered it to a random sample of um, several hundred customers and encouraged them, hey, do you want to try this new account? And, and also they had access to the old fashioned account with the same interest rate. And then another group was just offered the old fashioned account where they there's no financial chastity belt around. Um, and what they found is that the group that had access to these commitment accounts saved 80 percent more than others year over year. And that's with only 30 percent even using them. This, this group still saved 80 percent more total, which is just an enormous increase. Uh, oh, tremendous, um, especially compound interest, all this stuff that oh, that math is astronomical. Amazing. It's amazing. And, uh, and I think, you know, it, it highlights the power of, um, of commitments of basically voluntarily, when you recognize a temptation is coming, we can do things to actually constrain um, ourselves and our future behavior so that we'll make better decisions. And the, the like classic example of this from literature that people might have heard of is Ulysses tying himself to the mast and the Odyssey yes. um, to avoid, you know, giving into the temptation to steer his ship off course towards the island with sirens um, who are singing sweetly, but they are deadly. Ship. Yeah, exactly. So um, he he realizes this is coming and he has himself bound to the mast so he won't be able to redirect his ship and everyone who's rowing um, but plugs their ears with wax. So that's like the classic example. But you can also do it with your savings account and you can do it with any goal. Um, one of my favorite ways of doing this is with cash commitment accounts. So there's a couple different websites you can use. Um, Stick.com is one. Beeminder is another. I'm sure there are more where you can go put money on the line that you say, hey, take my money from my account if I fail to achieve goal X. So goal X, it might, it might it's a little weird to do it, think about doing it with savings, but you can think about doing yeah. it with, you know, how many times you want to work out a week or, um, you know, how many times you want to have meetings with your trainer each week. Without a doubt. Um, right. Okay. So whatever that is, um, you put the money on the line, you declare a referee who will hold you accountable, and then the money goes away. So you're fining your future self for not achieving your goals. And if you make those goals bite-sized and sort of weekly and doable, this kind of um, technique basically increases the price of your vice, and it's been shown really effective. So 
smokers who have access to these kinds of accounts are 30% more likely to be able to quit, for instance, than other smokers who have access um, only to sort of standard ways of, of trying to motivate themselves to quit smoking. That's one of my favorite examples. But so if we can think about we're used to other people setting up penalties yep. and uh, constraints for us. Like that's very natural. But but when we know ourselves and know what kinds of temptations we might fall prey to, we can set them up for ourselves too. And and you know who better to set constraints than you? You won't, there's not going to be any backlash. <laughs> no, not yeah. That I, I think that's th- there's a great example there. And by the way, you mentioned the price of your vice. That's the name of your next book. The price of your vice. That's phenomenal. Um, no, yeah. And and when you talked about, you mentioned constraints now, I think I counted it five times, so I have to go here. And it talks about the adjacent possible that we are kind of getting into and you setting your own constraints. A, an area that we found this is, so we teach workshops that are all about u- utilizing improv for leadership development, right? Getting people reps in types of interactions that they may or may not have, but inevitably we typically don't rehearse or refine for some of life's biggest moments, right? And these interactions can cost us dearly. And so what I found early on when we were doing this, because this is what was tied to my research and it complements what you're saying, is when we gave people certain constraints, say we are creating an improv or role-playing activity, there tended to be a little bit more reticence, right? Like, oh, well, this might, this would never happen or I don't understand and I don't know and they're nervous. So what we started doing is saying, we gave them almost a template and we said, okay, you create the constraints. There's rules, rules, and, or, and the rules was, you know, just, uh, that was our layman term for saying constraints, rules, rules, and, and more context. So the rules were like, Hey, who are you in the context of this scene? Are you a coach and athlete? Are you a researcher and, and a prominent CEO? What have you, what are the constraints? Oh, I can only ask questions. Um, uh, my tonality has to be off the charts, right? Which inevitably could change a perception of the interaction. And then where's the environment. And we noticed that people got more, way more engaged in taking control of their experience at the workshop. Instead of hiding in the background, they now felt, I'll fail, but I'll fail on my terms. Does that make sense? Or is that just, does that sound odd to you? I love that. No, it makes so much sense. And in general, you know, I think we underappreciate how much more people will achieve when we give them more autonomy um, and and more more of an opportunity to take charge of how uh, decisions will play out. And I, I mentioned earlier how powerful it can be to actually put people in the role of advice giver when they're used to. Um, just getting advice. I talked about my, my mentor who like had his more senior students coach the more junior students. I think it's actually a really related concept. And we've shown in our research that when you put someone in the role of advisor, so they're like, they're the one coaching, they're the one setting up the situation that they, they dredge up insights about themselves. They wouldn't have otherwise, they're more bought in They're um, they're more likely to achieve their goals. And I, I love that you're sort of using autonomy in that creative way. Yeah, well, I'm glad that I'm not insane because I always wonder, it's always nice to be around people that uh, uh, value the messiness of this because you ideate, right? You get this idea of like, all right, this hypothesis seems to be working now. How do I generate data off this and what have you? Um, it, it brings in something we talked about off air. There's sometimes people that have a reticence to change. Now, a lot of the people that seek you and you out they're smart enough and open enough. And, uh, I would say, you know, in this, in this growth mindset place to, they say, Hey, uh, I don't need to be sick to get better. I'd like to change. And I'd love your advice. That said, I mean, you have worked with an incredible retinue of individuals, right? Like, do you ever find that, you know, for that door to open? And I, of course there's third party introductions and what have you. Do you ever find that for the initial interaction before you can even get to the meat of helping them understand their problem, that you over you you encounter some of these barriers to getting them to one say hey Dr Milkman's the one that we need here uh, she has research that's fascinating or has that become kind of automatic given your status at Wharton and the folks that have written testimonials for your book you know talk to me about any barriers you feel there still I think actually one of the biggest barriers is that um, often when I talk to organizations where I want to test a new idea. There's so much eagerness to just um, take the idea because they like it mm. and apply it. And actually, the, the barrier is testing. So that's a big challenge I've always found is convincing organizations. Like, you don't know how many times I thought I knew the right answer, but I was wrong. Right. So start <laughs> we slow. Don't test. I might give you bad advice and then you're going to make things worse. So I'll give you an example. We already talked about one saving study. And anyway, but I'm going to give you one other, which is... Um, we had a, an organization that wanted to encourage more 401k savings and 
you know, it's a common problem. I get, I get a lot of 401k calls. Yeah. Hey, whatever really works. Important problem. I study behavior change. People's lives will be a lot better Money's if they important. have that saving. So, um, we said, you know, like there's a lot of science showing that if you tell people everybody else is doing it, they're more likely to jump on the bandwagon because they're like, oh, well, Social you know, proof. that's if everybody else is doing it. I can probably figure it out too. I should probably do this thing too, right? I don't want to be the odd man or woman out. So we said, why don't we test that with 401ks and see if we tell people, you know, most of your colleagues are saving, which was true at this organization, it was just a small minority who weren't, uh, if that would increase enrollment. And we luckily were able to convince them to do an experiment. And what we found was exactly the opposite of what we'd expected. So first we tested, telling it does telling you uh, everybody else is doing it increase your likelihood to save? And it backfired. It reduced your likelihood to save. Really? Second, we tested the number we showed you. So how large the majority was that was saving. We did this by either comparing you with people in your five-year age group or your 10-year age group. So we got that variation in the exact number of your peers who were saving. And we saw that the higher the number we showed you, the less likely you were to save. So like a double backfire effect. Um, if we hadn't tested it, this company would have implemented because they thought, this is a great idea. You, there's lots of research showing this works. But in this particular environment, what we discovered, the numbers were, were really high. They were surprisingly high, it seemed. And what, what we think happened, and I still don't know the answer for sure, to be honest, but what we think sort of piecing together the, the puzzle pieces and giving it our best guess with what we know is that it was actually demotivating on this large cumulative goal to see everybody else was already way out in front of you. And people felt like, you know, it's too far away. It's yeah. not like something where I can just change and, and tomorrow I'll have enough for retirement. Like if the Joneses are already invested in that nest egg, like I'm just, I'm so far behind, it's hopeless. And they sort of throw up their hands. So a big, um, and, and we see that this is the biggest, the backfire effect is biggest for the lowest earners. So a big takeaway from that for me was like, one, I'm so glad we convinced this, this company to test because so many organizations, I really have trouble convincing them don't just take an idea that sounds good. Let's see. Let's A-B test before we break something that's and, and make it worse. Yep. Um, and two, uh, you know, that was a really important insight about uh, when we want to use social norms and, and in, encourage people to achieve more based on seeing others who are achieving a lot. It, it needs to be not too much of a stretch. Like it needs to be someone and, and a goal that you can see yourself achieving in the near term or else it can actually be a turnoff. I think that's a great example, especially because, you know, we, we, we always hear about this idea of hyperbolic discounting and then we hear about social proof. We hear Wait, about you always hear about the idea of hyperbolic discounting because that makes me really happy, but I do not feel like that is a house. Um, well, it's something that I feel like, and again, I'm biased because my, my research and the stuff we live in this kind of behavior change world as well. And I just feel like there's, there's been so much kind of talked about with this, Hey, like I, you know, I'm going to go for, uh, let me be frank. And this won't, this won't make my listeners happy. We see it even when we market our products. So we'll put out a course and we'll hit our newsletter and say, Hey, there's this course. And, uh, there was one before COVID that we put out to help coaches create something lateral for themselves because coaching, I mean, the majority of coaches, even when they have master's degrees, they make less than $40,000 and that's nothing to scoff at. But as the point is, is they don't just make that the ceiling's not much higher. You have kind of feast and famine in coaching. So you can make, uh, somebody can make several hundred thousand dollars or somebody can be stuck in a restricted earnings position where they're making 18 to 25 and they might have two degrees to their name and tons of experience or what have you. So we said, well, why don't we put something out that helps coaches? Cause there's no governing body that, uh, that teaches them financial planning, financial management, anything about a contract. Some of these coaches are signing contracts that they, they have no concept that if they create intellectual property of some kind of this place, it's no longer theirs, um, that they have no idea what they're signing. So we created a course all about that. Just like, Hey, you periodize, which is just our fancy term for planning. You plan your athletes training programs, do the same for your career. And, you know, this was something I was brought up with just because my father was a financial advisor. He always said, hey, protect your backside, not a doomsday prepper, but protect the backside. The upside will take care of itself. He was, he was broke, right? And my family encountered a lot of interesting things. I was hospitalized at a young age. My brother was stabbed. You know, like we just, we had this thing of like, you've got to be, uh, you've got to be positive and have a positive outlook about the future, but still be pragmatic. Okay. So what we found is initially when we released this, like, yeah, our core audience, they gravitated to it. They loved it. But it was kind of like, you know, uh, if James Cameron released a movie that was supposed to be this blockbuster based on the data that he collected and audience wants, desires, and needs, which we did, we had over a thousand responses and it just kind of was ho-hum. 
It did okay. We were happy, but ho-hum. So we sent out some non-buyer surveys. We figured this out. People, you know what they said? And going back to hyperbolic discounting is, well, you know, I, I, I just think I need to focus on the now. Like I need to just keep my head down. I need to keep grinding. I need to be grateful for what I have. It's not as bad as I thought. And then COVID happened. And within four months, we all of a sudden started getting alerts on our phone and sales skyrocketed. And one of my friends said, you should be happy. I go, I'm not, right? Because I don't want something like this. Talk about timing. I don't want something like this to happen for somebody to utilize a product that was meant to be proactive in nature. And we just saw, I mean, hyperbolic discounting, especially with uh, folks in education and coaching, because they don't want to be expectant. They don't want to be needy. They don't want these things. They want to just, hey, I'm happy with what I have and I'm grateful, but that can have a vice. Talk about the price of your vice. Does that, am I, am I way off? Is that a horrible example? No, it's a fabulous example. I love it. I mean, it is, you're right. You like, you don't want to have to solve a problem. You want to prevented the problem from arising. And it sounds like, you know, with COVID, it was a wake up call for all of us, for everyone who didn't have emergency savings, for everyone who didn't have a backup plan. And ideally, we would help people so that they were in a good position when that moment comes instead of having them panic and realize they need to put themselves in a good position now. So I, I want to honor your time. And the thing that I need our listeners to understand about your book, and I, I want to ask you about memory places, we could talk for two two hours about some of the stuff you put in here, but I just have to share deep admiration. I've read a lot of behavior change books in the last 10 years. A lot of uh, ones that have made a lot of bestseller lists. They're interesting. They have stories. But at the end of the day, I'm like, what do I do? I love that you at the end of it said, hey, here's the stories. Here's the research, but here's what you can do. Here are the five bullet points that you can take away from. Here's the things that you can create from this. If there's one thing that you feel like you haven't been able to get across, or maybe somebody hasn't asked you about your book and the important thing it touches on for people learning how to change, what is that? Or what made you structure the book in that way? What frustrated you about prior work in this space, aside from people just not focusing on the fresh start? Like, Talk to me about the architecture of this that gives you hope that, yeah, this will help people change. There's two things I hope that readers will really take away from this. The first is um, clarity that there's not a one size fits all solution. It really depends on what's holding you back. And sometimes there's multiple things holding you back, but that, that spending a little time to figure out what is the obstacle and then match the solution to that obstacle can help you get a lot further faster. And then the second thing is that it's not like a one and done and it's not easy. Uh, it, it's, um, it's going to be, there's going to be setbacks and it's going to be important to recognize that none of this miraculously goes away. It's not like if you read the book and apply the principles for a month, you'll have changed forevermore. Um, that isn't, there is no magic to it because the the features of human nature that make change hard will keep working against us. That doesn't mean it has to be painful. A lot of the solutions are, are I think, actually really wonderful. Like, making it more fun to accomplish your goals is one of the most important things you can do. For instance, that's not painful to do forever. No. Um, but, but it needs to be like the mindset should be, um, if you're committed to change, that it isn't a quick fix, uh, and that it, it's probably a constellation of things. And, and what works for the, in the short term may not be the same thing you need a year from now, because you may be facing different obstacles as you advance. So I hope the book provides really all the best science out there so that it's no longer sort of guruism, but rather evidence that can guide you on your path to change. Yeah. The, the not one size fits all part is huge because that's what frustrates me with people that digest this material and what they're looking for is the answer to questions like, I mean, I get it all the time. Hey, what book should I read? What should I, what, what uh, grad assistant job should I take? What should I go to this or that? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's the ugly, it depends answer. You know, it, it depends. And if they can pick up your book and understand the, the getting started problem, the impulsivity problem, the procrastination problem, the forgetting problem, the laziness problem, all the aspects that your chapters uncover and say, okay, Katie says this, let me orient this into my life, my messy reality, and let me find the right fit. They'll get something out of it. But if they expect just some magic answer on page 47 that worked for Google, and guess what? Now they're going to be able to like, this worked for Google, this should work for us. That's not reality. And that's where we have to look at ourselves to change our behavior and our expectations. 
I mean, I, I, I could ahead. not have said that better. I love it. Well, it was just refreshing for me to finally read a book that wasn't guruism about this stuff. Cause I think, uh, there, there's things that can be considered pop science. Yours is anything, but I'm a deep appreciator of it. I'm deeply appreciative that like you let us go into your athletic background. I hope to be a value to you in the future. If, if we can help any way from research we've done or open up part of the sports performance world, if you want to look at change and anything there, you just call on me. Uh, this was an incredible episode and I thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Brett. This was tremendously fun for me. I really, really enjoyed it. Absolutely. So guys, make sure we're going to have the link so where you can buy Katie's book. We're going to have her social media links, her website, everything. You will have no excuse. It's shared on our social media. Get your butt to the website. Support people like Dr. Milkman that are trying to be proactive. They know they don't know it all, but they're willing to get their hands dirty. This is Brett Bartholomew, the Art of Coaching podcast with Dr. Katie Milkman. Talk to you soon. Hey, hey, hold up. Don't go anywhere just yet. I hope you enjoyed that interview. If you did, could you do me a favor? Please just take a moment and leave a podcast review. I know you have many things that you have to do. I know that you just listened to this whole episode. We really appreciate that. But we're a small family-owned business, and we depend on reviews like yours to get the word out about our show. So if you can go to iTunes and just leave a quick review, we'd really appreciate it. And if you don't have an Apple device, simply share with a friend or five or 20. We'd really appreciate it, and we're so thankful for your support.